Good morning. Morning, guys. On behalf of PC Power, um, thank you very much for joining us today um, for this one hour webinar on solar pumping technologies. Um, I'm, today is here, I have uh, Chris Lipko, which is joining me here from the Celsius staff uh, team. And my name is Luis. So we're going to be walking you through the Easy. important steps of the variable frequency drives for solar applications. So without any view delay, and I get into it. So we've got a little disclaimer there in front there just for you guys to read through. Um, all these d documents will be sent through to you so you can read it in your own time and your leisure. But if you want to quickly look through it for a couple of seconds, just have a look through there and get started. Awesome. Okay, so many applications for uh, solar pumping. Mm -hmm. uh, after all, this technology is able to drive any asynchronous motor. Correct. Whether it is on a house, on a factory, on a farm, on a mine, of a number of different applications and scales. So we have applications from as small as 500 watts mm -hmm. to as big as 200 kilowatts. So it's a great range of applications, if you will. So just to touch on the, on the VSD, so a lot of guys ask, what is a VSD or a VFD? So a VSD is actually a variable speed drive. So it just changes the frequency of how a motor or a pump actually works. Instead of running at full throttle, it will ramp up from a low frequency and run up and run fully at 50 hertz where it's supposed to be. Very good. So in a nutshell, in this schematic, we can see the main components of a solar pumping system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the first one is obviously uh, the solar panels. So we need to have power generated from the sun. Mm -hmm. This is fed into the pump inverter. The pump inverter is in essence uh, a three in one. If you will. So the first thing that it is, is an inverter. So it's able to, from, to produce uh, AC power, both one phase and three phase, from a DC power supply. Uh, secondly, it's a um, rectifier, if you will, because it is able to take power from the grid and feed it to the inverter, so the inverter can feed it out at a different frequency. Because as you might understand, the pump inverter do drive the pump through changing the frequency and the voltage in the output. So when the pump inverter is utilizing the AC input, it's doing a double conversion. It's first rectifying the power into DC, that 230 volts, uh, 50 hertz, which is fixed, and it's feeding that into the DC bus, and then the inverter is taking that and supplying a variable output as the pump requires a voltage and frequency, right? Um, <clears throat> and the third function is um, being an MPPT. So. So some of the models uh, that, that we sell do have a, a multi-point power tracking circuit on it. So they're able to very smartly squeeze more power out of, of the hours of the day. Um, so what you will see there is that your pump inverter is connected to your municipal pump in this diagram. It could be a centrifugal pump in surface. It could be any kind of pump. It could be a conveyor belt. It could be anything that actually has an asynchronous motor and, and that actually can run at variable speed. So for a water pump, variable speed is acceptable for some applications you want a constant speed. Uh, the last element in this diagram, I think it's an important one, um, is that we have an overhead tank. So not necessary in every application, but highly recommended. Why? What your overhead tank is your battery. So you're, if you require to irrigate 24 hours a day, or if you want to have water available 24 hours a day without the input, um, if you oversize your system in such a way that you can pump during four or five hours a day enough water for a 24 hour period into an elevated tank, you have essentially created your own battery. So potential energy on the tank will supply the pressure to your system. And drip. So your drip irrigation, those kind of things, this is all providing as well that your hole can deliver the amount of water you need in a 24 hour cycle. Or, or a reservoir, could be a river, could be a catchment area, right? So when we're talking about a tank, this could be a small dam on top of a hill, it could be in a small tank, a small tank as well on a top couple of a hill. Tanks, yeah. Correct. So that is your battery is much less expensive and reliable than having to have a battery, a battery system. Correct. So now we carry on here. So solar pumping concepts. So it just tells you what it's actually doing, what we just explained now, is that it takes DC power from solar panels, converts it to AC to run an AC pump. We can do AC pumps from 500 watts all the way up to 200 kilowatts, like we were just saying before. Um, typically, a pump inverter changes the frequency of the, of the pump to run. So 
every motor, every pump runs on about 50 hertz. What a VSD does, it'll start at a low frequency of about 37 hertz, and it'll start running the pump. And as the day progresses and the voltage in the panels progress and get higher, it'll ramp up to 50 hertz and run at its peak. And as the day goes down, it'll start going down again in the speed. So you can alternate and change the frequency. That you can also use this, as Louise was saying earlier, to um, control the, the flow of the supply of water that you need. So if instead of having a thousand liters of water you want an hour and you want it only 800, you just change the frequency, the pump would pump slower, which would inevitably give you less water. There's a limit to how slow the pump can, can rotate. Correct. So these inverters have a frequency band. So for a startup, the inverter is able to increase frequency and voltage from zero volts and zero hertz to 230 volts per phase and 50 hertz. Mm -hmm. But once the pump is running, you could on demand lower that frequency or increase in frequency. I think that the margin there is about a 15, 20% band, both up, up or down. Up down. <clears throat> so moving on to the next one. So as, yeah. as we said earlier, what is a pump inverter or what is a VSD? So it's a real speed drive that literally takes DC power, converts it to AC and runs your motor. That's what it just does. It's got a lot of the, the smaller VSDs have got a PWM control units and they've got IGBTs to regulate the AC output. <clears throat> Correct, so it's a well-known technology, full width modulated to produce an AC output. Mm -hmm. So um, in order to, to, to maximize uh, the amount of hours that, that, that inverter pumps during the day, is that the, the inverter has been equipped with a feature to change the frequency. Mm -hmm. Because the power required by a pump is proportional to essentially the flow and the height of the pump. Mm -hmm and a centrifugal pump that is proportional to the speed of the pump. Too. So a submersible pump is most times as well as a centrifugal pump. Um, I stand to be corrected, of course, there is some more uh, progressive cavity pumps, PCPs, those screw type of pumps into which is slightly different this, uh, this equation. Um, so in essence, so the VSD is allowing us to start a pump with a limited amount of current. So that's why we are actually ramping up the frequency slowly over a two to five minute period. Mm -hmm. So we can have a match of uh, one to one between a VSD and a pump. Depending on the depth again, and depending on the distance of where your VSD will be. Correct. The VSD can be programmed to a target pump flow. Mm -hmm. If we know actually the production charts of the pump and the, the height and flow of the pump versus RPM, then that can be translated into frequency and therefore the, the inverter can be set a specific frequency point. So now we have here an example, um, it's a little Excel that we put together to try and illustrate this concept, okay? Again, yeah, sorry, sorry. Guys, all this information will be related to you guys by email. We'll send you the calculations, it's very easy. If you guys do get stuck, we are here, you can just give us a shout. Shout, sure, correct. Um, but this is quite graphic and, and, and straightforward, so at this point, we have selected 10, 10 hours of daylight. Um, so that, that gives us that semi-approximate blue shape that we have there. We have selected a random pump, pump size, 2.2 kilowatts. And we have selected a random size of solar array as well, 3.3 uh, kilowatts. Um, then we have played with how many hours of full, full power pumping we want. What do I mean with that? That orange figure that we have there, at the top you can see it's flat, that represents your pump working at 100% rating. So from, from those hours in the day, you have enough power coming out of the pump inverter for your pump to operate at 50 Hertz. And 50 Hertz will be 2550 RPM or whatever RPM is, is your pump, um, your motor designed to do at that frequency and whatever height and flow. But it's 100% power at that setting. You will see that to the left of that setting, let's say from nine in the morning, the pump starts at some point pumping slowly. If it is a submersible pump, you might not even see a thing because the pump is just pushing water up the column, right? Until it eventually develops enough energy, enough height, to start pushing water out on the, on the, on the surface. Yeah. Uh, if it is a centrifugal pumping surface, you'll see a trickle of water quite immediately if there is no back pressure on the outlet of the pump. So in other words, if you're just filling a tank, you will see a trickle. Mm -hmm. If you are uh, pumping from a borehole, you will probably be, see nothing until you achieve enough height to see the depth of the hole, yes. And then you get an amount of hours of the day into which 
course, we are assuming there is no cloud conditions in this case. You see the blue shape is quite nice. Um, your pump will start not having enough power to run maximum power, and the inverter will start backing down the frequency, therefore slowing down the speed of rotation of the pump until such a point that there is not enough power to, to keep the, the frequency and voltage stable and the inverter switches off. If you had connected to this inverter an AC supply, there will have been an automatic change over to AC if you want to pump 24 hours a day. Okay. So we do have some models of the VSDs that have an AC couple. So you could run them directly from the solar panels. And if there was days of cloudiness that you did want to run off AC, you could connect a generator or also connect your single phase or three phase um, municipal supply directly to the VSD. Only on some models though. Only on some models, correct. Um, so all the small, small models, so everything is 2.2 kilowatts is built in. Bigger than 2.2 kilowatts is an external module essentially, which is sensing the, the voltage on the PV circuit. <laughs> What this chart is telling us as well is that, well, the daylight hours during the year on seasonal countries, South Africa is a seasonal country, yeah. do change quite a bit. So obviously between summer and winter, you can have easily some three hours of difference. And uh, both, both on the amount of daylight hours, and of course you have an implicit reduction in the energy that you get supplied by the sun itself, right? So. Your pump inverter will behave better in summer. It will pump for longer hours, maximum speed, it will produce more water, and it will conversely produce less water in winter. If you have a mission critical application that needs the same amount of water winter and summer, you have to do your design based on the conditions in winter. Therefore, that will operate well in winter and excellent in summer. Okay, something to keep in mind. It's just implicitly in there when you're talking about solar pumping. So the way we do that, sorry, is with over panel on the system. So instead of having the correct amount of panels just to the summertime, we'd have a panel on the VSD to give you a lot more hours during the winter as well. And obviously in the summer, you'll have a lot, lot more water than what's required. That, that is correct. Um, so this is the example I was talking just previously, into which we actually have a pump, and the pump only starts producing water in the surface at a certain time of the day. But the pump actually started probably two hours earlier, right? And the reason is that that in some applications you, you have to build up pressure before you start to produce. So especially on borehole, on borehole applications, you need to oversize your PV array quite a bit to make sure you start producing early. Um, not necessarily the case when you're using an application where the discharge of the pump is atmospheric. Yeah. You're filling a reservoir yeah. right there on the surface, right? So moving on here to the next slide. So again, like we were saying earlier, to run for 24 hours, you could use the VSD and then use your dam or your tanks to pump enough water during the day up to a hill or elevated tanks. And then later on at night, you can use that as a gravity feed to drip tray or drippers or um, normal irrigation. If you guys need high pressure booster irrigation, then obviously you'll have to put in an AC or run a battery type of backup to give that booster pressure to give you a lot more um, pressure on, on the output. But majority of the guys just use tanks and dams, do drip irrigation at night, and during the day you can pump directly from the VSD. That, that is correct. Um, now, depending on your application, it tends to be better just to oversize your system to be able to pump this water to an elevator reservoir. Mm -hmm. uh, domestic application may be difficult because to achieve three bar, you need a significantly very high, high tank. Mm -hmm. um, but for Commercial and agricultural applications, this is something that can be can be used. Yeah. Uh, difference of height on a the terrain of 40 meters is probably easy to achieve in some part of the country. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where you want to put your reservoir. So you can have now high pressure three bars at least on the on the, on the offtake point. Other alternative is you use this equipment A to be able to pump when there is load, load shedding, because this device will pump if there is no AC. Mm -hmm. So in those 24 hour pumping applications, you can have an AC feed or a diesel generator connected to the pump inverter. Right. But if all fails, you still have the possibility of pumping five hours a day. Right? Directly from the sun. Directly from the sun. But otherwise, you connect your pump inverter to your pump and um, 18 hours or 16 hours per day, the pump inverter is pumping from an AC source. And then the rest of the time is pumping from your solar source. This is for applications where you need 24 hours pumping. Um, the pump inverter will not see a difference in between the, the generator and or the grid. And it comes with a dry context that can be used to actually start uh, diesel generators. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so this is for the cases that you have a remote system and you're not able to go physically. And switch it on and off, yeah. Switch it on and off. So we'll touch on that a little bit, little bit further more. on. So, of, yes, course, yes, yes. of course, depending on your application, right? So if you are the kind of application, I'll give you an example, agricultural for cattle, right? Mm -hmm. You probably will be fine with four to five hours per day just to fill surface tanks, trucks, correct? But if you're in an agricultural application on irrigation and your crops actually do require water constantly every single day without a fault, um, you will experience a very high cost if you're running a diesel system. Um, well, you can see differences there on the slide, but it's a no-brainer, right? Yeah. So both the pump inverter and the solar PV models connected to it are very longevous components. E even if the pump inverter <coughs> would fail within the first 10 years, it's a relatively inexpensive element compared to the failure on the generator and a repair on the generator and the diesel savings are huge. So if you see that on the image on the right, um, while the initial expenditure to go on and set up a solar pumping system is without a doubt higher, only twice as much as, as required to do a, a diesel setup, um, over a long period of time, the, the running cost of the system, the difference is vast. And, and this will just go down to the bottom line of the of the company running running the system. So remember, guys, solar panels majority of the good quality ones in the market have got about twenty five year warranty. The VSEs that we do have got a decent warranty as well from the supplier or manufacturer. These generators, as you can see, they the running costs a big factor. They will be diesel, obviously. Costs fluctuate there continuously. Your maintenance costs on that, as you can see there, your two hundred fifty hours, your thousand five hundred hours services, those fluctuate as well. With the solar panel system or the VSD system that you put up with solar panels, the majority of the maintenance you need to do there is clean your panels and make sure your cables are still clean and neat and out of the way of rats and kind of things like that. That's, that's about it. Where with diesel, your costs will always be a lot higher than anything else. That is very correct. Okay, so in essence, we have um, two series of <coughs> inverters. We have the Good Drive 100 series, which runs from very small to super large, so yeah. from 500 watts to 100 kilowatts mm -hmm. per unit. Um, so it's a highly customizable series of product. Um, so I would not like to see it's an entry level. It's actually a more professional product. It's a product that can be customized um, to yeah. your specific needs and budget. Correct. Correct. And then we have the BPD series, which is in essence the gods of the BPD series. It's a good drive 100, mm -hmm. but it's an all-in-one into what all the niceties that can be nice to have on the Good Drive 100 have been built in. So it's an inverter that actually has an MPPT tracker, has auto AC, auto switch. So those are the two features that can be optional in the Good Drive, mm -hmm. and, and a booster, and a PV booster, and are built in into the PVD series. Also, the Good Drive um, version is not IP65, where the BPD is, so you can put it underneath your panels out in the field and not have to worry about it. It's correct. It's yes. just that the BPD series is, is limited to relatively small yes. single phase and three phase pumps. Correct. Okay, so now let's learn a little bit more about the Good Drive 100 or the GD100 mm -hmm. as we call it. So it's got a built in PWM controller, so pulse width modulator. Some of them have got auto switching function, as you can see, they're up to the 2.2 kilowatts. The remote AC switch module control, and then obviously the power range. Can go from anything between the 500 watts up to 200 kilowatts. So as you can see, there also the PV booster is module or is is um, sorry, is optional compared to the BPD, which is really built in. So the setup on these things are very basic, guys. It's almost like a type of plug and play. There's very minimal parameters need to be set up. Just pretty much the parameters of the motor. Correct. Motor so, size, operation, voltage, operation, frequency of the motor. Uh, a few optional parameters with regards to auto start and restart, AC usage, just no. Um, very good documentation as well that comes with the with the inverter. Yeah. Um, the inverters do come with um, optional, um, if you will, secondary keyboard, yeah. uh, which you can see installed on the big inverter on the right. Mm -hmm. On the small inverter on the left can be installed. Otherwise, you can use the one that comes on the display. Right. So that secondary display can be wired away on a control room, an office, or outside little boxes to navigate. Correct. Correct. So you don't have to necessarily walk into the Put of the pump to actually do this. Right. So we'll, we'll see here why we had to do GD100. So uh, the manufacturer of the drives, uh, IMBT is a very large company, 
Um, they do uh, frequency drives for a number of applications from industrial, petrochemical, elevators. Most of the lifts that you actually use around the world actually use frequency, frequency drives from, from, from IMBT. Um, but previously, I'm saying pre-2015, there was a number of different versions of, of these pump inverters. Um, non, all of them actually share the same parameters, the same configuration, the same treats. So your knowledge had to be a lot more extensive Correct. to set up different versions and different models of the DSDs. Correct. So they unify all the families under one family, similar to Airbus, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can fly one, you can hopefully fly all the rest because they operate the same way. So the number two is... Um, so the previous versions, yeah. A lot of the performance was, was underrated on the older versions. The newer ones, the performance um, ratio is a lot, pretty, lot more improved. That, that is correct, mm -hmm. especially on the older, older models. You had to know certain things from your motor that sometimes doesn't even come on uh, the data plate of the motor. The resistance of the motor, inductance, and a number of variables. Um, so that led to a lot of doubt on the customers, and that led to inputting a lot of wrong information on the pump inverters and failures. Wrong ones between boards, wrong sizes. Correct. So now the inverter has an automatic configuration mode. So after you have set the basic parameter, uh, on the first start, the pump inverter goes and measures those electrical parameters on the pump circuit. So therefore, it reduces the guessing to the absolute minimum and reduces the failures uh, due to that. And the third one is um, the, the inverters were actually oversized a little bit to its rating. So they could reduce um, substantially the, the failure rate. The failure rate on the electronic component is uh, proportional to the temperature to which it runs, which is proportional to current. So in this case, they added additional transistors, IGBTs, so they could reduce the amount of current per IGBT, keep them cooler. So this can operate as, a, as an enclosed device, which doesn't have uh, excellent refrigeration, right? Because it's inside of a box, box. Inside of a box mm -hmm. and it still have a very long, useful life. So now the, equipment, now the equipment actually has a very good and big range of operation temperature. Hence so the warranty is a lot bigger now. So, so that's the reason why GD100 was actually um, pre-developed from the previous value generations of pump inverters. Um, the system is really simple to use. It automatically starts when you connect your solar panels. Parameter setting okay. the cost is actually quite small. So again, the models, like I said, is 2.2 compatible with, with the boost module. And then obviously, the ones are different sizes. These panels, if you put in the booster module, um, you can implement the order switch between the PV and the grid, like we discussed earlier, and also obviously run the 24 hour cycle with your tanks elevated and all the So, we do have different versions from single phase, three phase, those kind of things. The GPRS module, which we'll touch on coming forward, the remote monitoring, which you get an app on your phone, which also touch on that, and then also the IP54 cabinet solution. So, we can literally give you a cabinet with your booster inside, your VSD, your switch protection, the whole plug and play unit. Literally, you go and you plug in, you pump in. You set up and you're good to go. Yes, that is that is correct. Okay, so on the models range, um, in essence, we can cater for all types of pumps. Yeah. So on, on single phase pumps, you have um, you see a 220 in, obviously 220 out in single phase. You, you have a very specific thing, which is that you have some very small three phase 220 volt mm -hmm. pumps, and those can be actually run out of a one phase 220 volt input because the inverter is able to actually produce three-phase output, even if it has a single-phase input on those small sizes, 0 0.4 to 0.2 kilowatt, for as long as, as it's three-phase to 20 volts. Then you have three-phase in, three-phase out for the same thing, 20 volt, three-phase. Mm -hmm. And then you have your typical, what, what we know as three-phase, which is 380, yeah. which is phase-to-phase. -phase. Okay. So, which is not the same than three-phase to 20. But in the pumping world, you get pretty much those four tiers of motors okay. connected to uh, synchronous motors connected to pumps. And again, you can see it's just a DG, the GG100 model range, not different ranges or different types of pumps or VSDs. You use one type, you, you, as long as we have the correct information from you regarding your pump and your depth and the voltage of which one it is, we can quote you accordingly to for exact the right amount of VSDs you need. That, that, that is correct. Now, some people ask me sometimes, I think it's a question from the previous seminar, uh, can we run two pumps with one pump inverter? as long as the pump inverter is big enough. So the answer would be, if the pumps are identical, so identical motor, pumping at identical heights, and obviously will be identical flows, um, then you could assume that those two pumps make one big pump. 
and then the two pumps could be run simultaneously. And we have a few pictures at the end of big pumping systems on farms, so we have actually four pumps uh, running simultaneously. Uh, now, can I have a booster pump and a, and a borehole pump running all together? No, you can, because the electrical parameters will be different, the speeds will be different, the power requirements will be different. So you cannot just add them together and get a bigger pump inverter. It, it won't work correctly. So in that case, you need actually separate pump inverters. So a little bit for ordering and then nomenclature. Mm -hmm. um, when we order, this is essentially what the, the, the part number means. The first one is the type of product, right? So GD100, then the rated power. So you can see there 5.5 kilowatts on the example, 5 bar, 5G. Then the voltage, so you have a three and a four. So if in this case, on the example, the first digit is four. That is telling us that it's a three-phase pump, 380 volts uh, phase to neutron. And the second digit is a protection level, which in this case is IP54. And the last digit is that it's actually a solar one, right? Um, because you can buy this drive as well, just without the solar feature. So the product specifications again, so you have four different models, which you can see there, the model SS2, S2, the two and the four. So SS2 will be more for the single phase in and out. Um, that minus two or dash two will be for 220 for three phase. And obviously your dash four will be for 380 in, 380 out. Also, you can see the maximum DC input voltage needed there on the SS2 on the single ones. That's with a PWM without a booster. You need a lot higher voltage, as you can see there. So, so in, in essence, what, um, what Chris is highlighting there is um, you do, may have to have very long solar streams to reach certain of these very high voltages. Yes. Um, which might oversize the system above what actually is required to, to start the pump in the morning. There is a module which is essentially able to boost the voltage coming from the solar panels by using a bulk boost uh, converter um, and then de deliver a fixed 400 volts input to the inverter. Okay, that's what we call a PV booster. So um, the GD100 comes with a few niceties. Um, they call them digital inputs. So it comes with four auxiliary contacts. S1, S2, S3, S4, um, which can be used actually to control the better against water sensors. So you can have a drywall sensor, which comes typically with 99.9% .9 of all the wall pumps. So the pump doesn't run dry. And then you can have a sensor that can stop the pump inverter when the, the tank is full, so the tank doesn't overflow, Perfect. right? So essentially when that sensor, depending on how much travel that sensor has, that's pretty much the times at which your pump is going to be full. Mm -hmm. Now, let's assume that you drain your tank overnight. So if your inverter doesn't have an AC input, mm -hmm. inverter will stay off. But as soon as there is power in the morning, you will, you will see that that, that, that uh, float is already down and it will start automatically. This is healthy. Correct. Um, now in this case, um, it's, it's one and S4, is used for telling the inverter essentially two functions. S1 is to tell the inverter to use PV as backup. So in other words, in other words if we connect S1 and common, we make a bridge, small cable wire, uh, we can disable the function of the inverter that makes solar the priority. So for whatever reason, if you want to use PV for some reason um, as your backup, then you will have to wire S1 and common. Um, then S4 and common is just to be able to tell the inverter that instead of being running a single phase pump that uses a two wire setup to start, is now using a single phase setup that uses a three wire to start. Okay? Because yes, there is single phase pumps that will require a three phase setup to start. Correct. Okay? So I will discuss it later. Correct. So um, basically, if you have one of those pumps um, which requires three wires to start, U, V, and W, okay? Um, you need to actually open the pump and remove all the capacitors. And then you will go and bridge uh, S4 and common, and you will connect the output of the inverter, UVW, to your pump UVW uh, connector. Okay, yeah. So, so the, the pump inverter do not need the, the capacitors. And if you leave the capacitors, it would not operate correctly. Correct. So this is a five minute operation. Normally in a, in, in a surface pump, there is a small cover on top. So these capacitors can be accessed, you know. Same with your ball pump. Sometimes you got a little control on top of the ground with two capacitors. I mean, you literally just take the cabling out of there and bridge it with the bottom cable to start it your pump. You can just disconnect the capacitors directly. Like bridging them is the same effect than cutting them. Correct. Yeah. Okay, so, so yes, the pump inverter can deal with either or these situations. Okay. 
So we spoke a little bit of the keyboard before, yeah, yeah. but I think that we can speak on it uh, in detail now. Mm -hmm. So you see, we have, regardless of the size of the inverter, it comes from two presentations physically. Yeah. So you have certain sizes that fit on the one on the left, mm -hmm. which is kind of the smaller versions, mm -hmm. and, and, and there is a number of um, of these size of power sizes that are actually fit in there. Mm -hmm. And then the larger ones, normally the three-phase ones, fit on the larger enclosure, yeah. larger plastic enclosure. <coughs> Now, on the smaller ones, there is a keyboard already. So you really don't need the auxiliary keyboard. You can just go and punch in there um, all the parameters and settings that you require. The reason why it doesn't have a smaller keyboard is because it's more for the smaller applications. So like, a guy's got a sweet pool pump, or he wants to run his quick pump, which is also a pool pump usually what the guys use, or a normal domestic ball pump. It's usually a VSD will be inside a little cabinet inside his house or his garage. But let's say you want to put a keyboard, you can. And you can see that in the small one, there isn't a small flap on the bottom right. Uh, or left, so sometimes you have to take, you can see it there by, by the logo of IMDT on the left, there is a small correction from there. You could actually wire the uh, normal Ethernet cable, because it uses a normal Ethernet cable, and wire that all the way to your living room, kitchen, whatever you want. So you could have a secondary Correct. display. So when the pump is operating, the display tells you what speed the pump is running, voltage frequency, gives you pretty much all the parameters. On the big one, the only option is that detachable, detachable uh, keyboard. keyboard. So now let's talk about the EMI filter. Uh, without going into too much details, um, all the pump inverters over 4.4 kilowatt, uh, which will be three-phase inverters, do come with a built-in bank of capacitors. The reason that you need those capacitors in some applications is that in very long cable lengths, um, you can get the ripple that the inverter produces on the power output, the power that it delivers to the pump. You can get the ripple wave to be amplified. Okay, so depending on the length of the cable and depending on the impedance of the cable as well. So in order to smoothen this ripple and, and, and avoid this ripple from amplifying to a point that it creates over voltage on the motor, you can take the cover of the inverter and you can enable with a jumper uh, J10 and J10 will actually put in line in parallel those capacitors to the output um, and therefore will then improve filters more than the ripple, right? So the smaller the ripple, then the less problems you're going to have with this amplification, okay? So similar to water hammer, right? So water hammer goes back and forth, back and forth. At some point, two waves actually find each other and they amplify themselves. So um, now we're going to go to the famous switching module, okay? So the small inverters, anywhere up to 2.2 kilowatts, has this built-in inside. Right. So they have an AC input and they have a PV input. Right. And then it will automatically detect when the PV input voltage is too low, mm -hmm. which essentially will tell the inverter, hey, there's not enough yeah. Correct. PV power available, therefore let me switch into the AC source. So again, the AC source guys can be either SCOM or your municipality or a generator. For bigger inverters, it's not feasible, it's not easier to pack that in inside of the of the of the yes. Yes. So a supplementary board, which is the voltage detection circuit that you see there, will actually be doing that job and will be measuring the voltage between PV positive and PV negative, and will be sending a signal to the pump inverter to close a relay. That's the famous KM1. Right in the middle of your page, guys. Yeah, the, the kilo mic one, so that relay will actually actuate a contactor and will bring the grid. So after the inverter sees the grid, we will then switch into a grid to supply the loads. Correct. Now again, whatever comes in is not exactly what goes out. So what goes out is what the pump inverter thinks the pump requires, mm -hmm. voltage and frequency wise. What goes in is 230 per phase, 50 hertz. When the voltage detection circuit uh, um, finds that there is enough voltage again on the PV circuit, it will then allow the PV power to come in and it will Take the power of KM1, so therefore the contactor opens, and we go back into solar. This can happen many times during the day. It can be beautifully sunny, then super Very huge, clouds. massive cloud comes in. We go back to grid, then the cloud goes away, and then we go back to solar, and we repeat that cycle on a cloudy day with patch clouds during the day a few times per day. A lot of guys have also asked between switching from AC to PV, can that damage the, um, the motor or the pump? The answer is no, because your switching is so quick and there's usually nothing inertia in your motor to carry on, carry on the switching between the AC and the PV. It, will, it may or not keep spinning depending on the, on the height and the flow on the back pressure of the pump, but the scientific answer to that is that the pump inverter controls the current that it comes out of it. 
So when the pump wants to start, it cannot just draw 14 times the amount of current again. So the pump inverter limits the amount of current. So you're never gonna damage, you will damage the pump if you're running from the grid, that is for sure, because you don't have a, a constant current start of your pump, but with a pump inverter you can, as many times as you want. Yeah. Okay, so that's a, that's a reason, technically speaking, for that. Correct. Right. Okay, so again, this is an additional board that you have to buy when you buy a pump inverter, more than 4.4 kilo. So this is how that pump switching module looks. It's nothing super interesting. So the board has got some heatsink. You guys can see that it actually bolts into the um, IP64, IP64 or 54 cabinets. Into the cabinet, which you're going to use to put your pump in there. Right. So this gentleman is sitting there. And he's monitoring the PV voltage on him. So now we're going to talk a few general rules with regards to um, selection of solar panels when we are not using um, a PV booster. So you see, at all times, we need to have enough voltage to start our pump inverter. As we saw before, some of the pump inverters require 550 and some require 330 volts, mm -hmm. depending on size. So 550 volts can be quite a few panels because we normally use one of the lowest voltages that a solar panel can provide, which mm -hmm. is the maximum power voltage. So we'll give you an example, a, a 72 cell panel, a big 365 watt panel, will have a BMP of about 34, 34 volts, more or less. So you need about 15 of those guys to make 550 volts DC. Okay. So that may be a lot more than what your pump requires. Okay. So this is why actually PV booster is great because the PV booster will take anything from 75 volts input and will make it 400 volts in the other. Okay. So it's great for all those models that you see there on the right that requires 330 volts DC. That's why the PV booster module is only sold for models of less than 2.2 kilowatts because it produces 400 volts. 400 volts is more than the 330 volts that all these models require to start. So what that will do is that will start your pump with less solar panels earlier on the day with less power, of course. So it will produce a little bit of less water, will give you more hours of pumping. So typically we always look at a minimum of 1.2 times the motor rated power on the PV. Uh, the, more, the more the happier, right? Because that will give you more reliance to cloudy conditions, will give you more pumping time during winter. So I'm not gonna say that the sky is the limit, because the limit is the maximum current that the inverter can take on the PV circuit. So that is your absolute maximum. Um, but since we actually do have an MPPT on some of these models, you will never over current your pump inverter. So that's a base on, on depending on where your pump is. Remember, the further away your pump gets from your VSD, the more panels you might have to put in, the bigger size VSD you might have to put in. That's why every system will be curtailed for your specific needs. So you can see here a comparison on the, on the small models, as we said, the PV booster, which is a separate module, right? It's the module that takes um, your low voltage coming from the PV circuit early in the morning and makes it into a fixed 400 volts output. Mm -hmm. It's only applicable to SS2, S2, and 2 models, okay? So, so you will see there that those 320 volts that you needed to achieve to start your SS2 model now transform into 100 volts only. So before you needed to have enough panels to make it to 320, mm -hmm. now you need to only have enough panels to make it 100 volts. So that in real life can make a huge difference in the amount of panels. Um, so we'll have a little exercise now that actually shows that. Uh, and this is how the PV boost module actually looks. It's only one size PV boost module, which can handle from the smaller inverter to the bigger inverter on the range, which is 2.2 kilowatts for this gentleman. Yeah. You will see that the minimum working voltage is actually 70. And it will always deliver 400 volts output. So now the output of this module is the input of your pump inverter. Instead of connecting your solar panels to your pump inverter, you connect them to this module. This module boosts the voltage to the 400 volts and then you pump, uh, should you pump, you plug that output into the pump inverter. So yes, it does cost some additional uh, money to buy this, this module, but in the, long, in the long run, it pays for itself. This also it helps with designing the system. So as we said, we'll share the, um, the calculations of how many panels you need per VSD, depending on the size of VSD. But by fitting a booster, you'll need a lot less panels, which means your cost will come down a lot more significantly as well. We have done a calculation that putting in a booster with a couple of panels will be cheaper than putting in the full range of the solar panels. That is correct. So um, this is the connection of the, of the PV booster to the pump inverter. It is plug and play. In one end, you have your PV input. 
In the other end, you have the boost module output, which goes into the inverter. And then there is just two pairs of twisted cables that go from the boost module to the inverter, which are properly labeled, so there's no way to miss them. That's it. Once you plug it in, you plug those communication cables, the pump inverter knows that it has a PU boost module. Correct. So it's already programmed to do what it has to do, so it's no configuration, no setting. Again, very easy setup, guys. Just plug and play, okay? So these typically will go inside of your enclosure. So if you want to start having a mental picture of that enclosure, that enclosure will have a GD100, which is your inverter. It will have a boost module if it is less than 2.2 kilowatts, right. okay? And if it is more than 4.4 kilowatts, you will have a PV switching board, right? That board that is monitoring the, the PV voltage right. to switch into a lift. Okay, so again, the same. So here we have an example into which we compare an, oh, a, an arbitrary pump inverter. Yeah. It's a three-phase 2.2 kilowatt inverter. And we see what's the amount of panels that we need with no booster and the amount of uh, PV modules that we require with booster. Mm -hmm. So you see that in one case we need 15 modules and in the other case we need 11 modules. So we do the calculation and the maths actually do check. So then on the right you can see physically how the inverter and the, and the PV booster look side by side. Yeah. Very easy and in wiring it actually fits in a quite, small. quite small enclosure. Correct. Okay. Now again, this is an IP54 box. But the equipment that is inside is IP20. Correct. So this equipment <coughs> cannot be outside of an enclosure. They have Only the GD100 model, the BPD models can be outside, guys. Those are the IP65 models, the gray ones. These ones have to be in an enclosure, water tights, with a bit of circulation, putting a fan in. We can definitely put something like that together for you guys. You are more than welcome to put in your own box. You could do your own box as well. Um, it's been some unfortunate misunderstandings in that sense. So again, this equipment is like a computer. It's not waterproof. It gotta be inside of an enclosure. You could put them straight into the wall if it is a room. Yeah. Um, it's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. That can be done as well as long as it's not going to get any water around them. It's perfectly okay. okay. It's perfectly okay. Okay. So this is the tables that actually you will receive with the rest of the information. So you get an you know, you get a view of how many panels you need per every one of the models. Okay, so then there is pre-assembled options, but we mostly use this picture just to give you a mental picture on how this enclosure looks. So what you have here is, in essence, um, two compartments. So we have one compartment on the top and one compartment on the bottom where we have actually the, the, the panels, right? So you have from left to right, you have the GPRS module, which we haven't discussed, but Gonna give a little bit of a sneak peek on it. Um, this is your cell phone module that monitors the behavior of the inverter and broadcasts the information from the inverter into a cloud server. That cloud server can allow you to actually see what's happening with your system from your app, from your phone, from your mobile phone, uh, app both from uh, iPhone, uh, iPhone and Android, iPhone and Android phones. Then to the right, this is more system, 2.2 kilowatts or less. You have your PV booster again. So we discussed what's the function of that. To the right, we have our pump inverter. For the rightmost from the pump inverter, you have a small fan board, which is just drawing power from your PV inputs, right? Mm -hmm. And then has a small uh, uh, boost converter inside that makes 12 volts actually to run that fan. Mm -hmm. It's a power supply. And that fan just keeps the enclosure actually cool because both the PV booster and the inverter generate heat during operation. Uh, below, you have all the AC connections and your breaker, and then to the left, you have all your DC connections, your fuses, and your switch arrest. It's that simple to wire, okay? Most of the failures actually we see is because of customers actually are skipping on the box and all the protections that you have there. Very important, guys, all the protection. Right, so I could say that the cost of everything that is sitting there, uh, additional, it's minimal percentage wise. You might be looking maybe at a most, maybe a thousand rands of more cost from all those protections, breakers, fuses, and search arrestors, and most. When this is more single phase setup, yeah. Uh, setup. Um, as well, the fan is quite inexpensive. But you will see that this box is actually an IP rated box because it comes with a rubber seal. Okay, you can see as well an antenna on top. That antenna can be as big as you want. Because remember, it's a cell phone antenna. Yeah. So that can be connected to a booster, cell phone booster which is supplied by another uh, solar source. So if this is remote on the field, it can have a very big antenna that allows you to have good connectivity to your pump. So now you don't have to go there <coughs> to switch on and off your pump, right? And you don't have to go there to set 
your power pumping and your pumping point. So you can tell the pump, pump more water, pump less water, stop, switch on, switch switch on etc. Et the same thing, but now for a bigger inverter. Now we, we draw the line of 2.2 kilowatts and we see how will it look with an inverter of more than 2.2 kilowatts. Well, now we, we see the bigger enclosure in there, plastic one, right? So it's a bigger inverter. Uh, you don't see a PV booster circuit because it doesn't exist in these bigger models, okay? So here we have to actually add enough panels to still meet the minimum voltage required by the inverter, right? That, that 550. Um, to the left, you have the GPRS module that you have seen. Right below, you have the voltage detection board. It was that, that one that we just discussed previously with the heat sink, but the heat sink is looking down at that point. So you only see the electronic board. Right? To the right, you can see your contactor, right? Which is run by a relay. The relay you can actually see there on the railing there. It's actually to the rightmost. So that's KM1. If you follow your lead rail to the rightmost, you will see there your relay. So the inverter is actually actuating the relay on the rightmost of the lead rail. Yeah. And that guy is actuating the contactor, which is labeled as contactor. Um, and then the rest is the same. You have all your DC protections, your search arrestor, your fuses in positive negative, um, uh, circuit breaker, and the same thing on the AC side, you have a AC breaker as well for the AC input. Okay, that's for the AC input. And you have your connection tab there. So same thing, you have a fan power board. That fan power board is supplied from the PV input. So that is essentially a small circuit that can produce 12 volts from as low as I think it is 100 volts to as high as 500 volts. So now this is the very same thing that the previous picture, just on a single line diagram. Okay, so here we explain again that the detection board, or the board that we use for the output to change over from solar to lead to lead to solar, it comes on two models, depending on the pump inverter size. So most common one is the QH100 055A. And, uh, and then you have the big one, which is the one that we use for the bigger ones. 18, yeah. Yeah, from 18 kilowatts all the way to 100. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not a beautiful wiring, but uh, you know, it's something we put together here for the, for the class. So you can have as well something a little bit more clear into how to wire um, the GV100 if you're going to do this, this type of wiring, okay? So now we're going to go into the CGD100 highly customizable. Do you want the PV booster? Yes, no. Do you want to include it? Do you want the auto switch on the big inverter? Yes, no. Do you want to include it? You want to put it all together and wire it all together in an IP54 enclosure? Yes, no. Here we have an inverter that is plug and play. You take it off the box, you put it out under the panels, you waterproof, you plug the panels on one end, it has a PV booster built in. You plug the grid on another end, it has an automatic AC switch. You plug your pump in the other end. This is what we recommend highly because at the end of the day, it costs actually less than doing all the previews, okay. all of the both. And um, the smaller kids. Correct. Okay. And it takes less time, it's less complicated. Okay, so it shares all the goodness of the GD100. The only downside is that it caps at 1.5 kilowatt trip. Yeah. So this is something that would probably do fantastic for most booster pumps, ball pumps, swimming pool pumps. I will even go commercial because you know 5.5 kilowatt wall pump is quite a decent one. So if you're actually producing water for cattle or for okay. any of these applications, it's quite a few cubic meters per day. Okay. So it has a very low starting voltage. It's only 80 volts on the PV side. Why? Because it has a PV booster built in. So um, essentially it comes on a number of models, so seven models, seven different models. You have there the data sheet of them. All the way from 750 watts to 500, uh, 5,500 watts. So you can see here slightly different uh, sizes, physical sizes of the inverter itself. So you have there the small one, the medium size, and you have a big size. This is how it looks at the bottom. Uh, all those connections are actually waterproof. So both on the AC, on the communications, on the C input, AC input, all of them, the inverter do come with a mating connector. So when you buy the inverter, you can do the bag with the mating connectors, so you can make your waterproof connections on your cables, right? Or brand new, or watertight. So it can run any type of pump, as long as it's a asynchronous pump, as we discussed uh, previously. Um, it does support ACDC input, and the AC bypass okay. function is completely built in. Right. Um, now, it shares most so of, the, of the wiring um, for the detail inputs from the GD100, because after all, 
this is a UV100 inside. Uh, what you will see is that you will not find S1 because S1 is actually wired to common or is close to common inside of the inverter. So, so in, in other words, um, this guy will give priority to the solar system instead of give priority to the okay? uh, You still have S4 in a different configuration here. So um, with this guy, S4 is not used to tell this inverter to start stop, um, uh, sorry, to start the pump with two or three wires. So if you have a pump actually with, um, with three wires, you're gonna have by default to one take those capacitors and connect UV and W. <coughs> Okay, so it's no need to go and, and switch uh, S4 to common. Right. So S4 here, we use it for a different function, which is to have, uh, to separate um, um, ways to start and stop your pump inverter. So as you see there, you have a little isolator that says run and stop. So this wasn't available on the GD100, it is here. So you can have like a push button. So if you, if you close that circuit, then your pump inverter will remain off continuously. And as you go and you rotate and don't press that button, then the inverter goes back yeah, to automatic. Yeah. So it's like a safety stop or a manual run stop or whatever you want to call it, okay? Then on top of that, you still have S2 and S3, which are dealing with your water tank full and dealing with yeah, yeah. your empty, empty wall. So main differences, there's no S1, so solar priority forever. Mm -hmm. Number two, you have a way to manually switch it on and off with a, with a rotor, rotary knob or any, any kind of switch. Number three, these inverters do have an RS-485 connection, okay, which you can see there. So if you want to communicate to inverter, you can, okay, and there's a communication protocol to it. Um, so this is the three main models, three main models and sizes, starting at 80 volts on the PPT range, which I think is awesome. And uh, again, this is the table, so the recommended PV depending on the size, right, so you can see there that Typically for a 2.2 kilowatt pump, you're looking at about more or less 11 panels for one to two hours per day. Uh, for seven hours per day, you will be looking a little bit more. You will be looking at two strings and so forth. Okay. Okay. <coughs> so the amount of hours per day depends on the amount of PV that you have. Right? So because you need to have that amount of power for more hours per day. So it's quite straightforward. So very convenient, you can still connect an external keypad to it, and when you buy it, it does come with an external keypad. Yes. And why? Because if you see the front of the inverter, it doesn't have any more yeah, display. So the only way that you can know what this guy is doing is either via the app or by plugging that keypad, right? So, so the keypad can be skip. Mm -hmm. so that's the way how you actually monitor this guy. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Being in year 2020, that's probably the way to go these days, right? Rather than having to be in front of the Very easy to find guys. So slightly different setup on the connections and how many connections are available depending on the size. So you can see that the four kilowatt and five kilowatt one, five and a half and four kilowatt, um, which is BLC on that image, do come with a two MPPT input, okay? which is great. So, you know, maybe yeah. maybe on your roof you have a roof hooking northwest and another one hooking east. So you can separate the panels from that side from the panels on the other side. Okay will maximize the amount of power that those two different arrays with different estimates actually produce during the day. The small ones of 2.2 kilowatts and less only have one input. All of them has an, an, an IP connection for the keyboard, every single one of them. Uh, every single one of them has a communications connection, a COM. That COM connection is the one that we mentioned RS485. So you, you can buy that Canon plug, you can connect it there, and with three wires you can connect this to a computer. Yeah. And then you can talk to the say that. Correct. And then on the on the bigger ones, actually you have the op option of connecting the GPRS. So you will see that there is a GPRS connection for the 4.4 and the 5.5. So you will see that there is a GPRS plug there. Essentially, the what is a little box for the GD100 with an external antenna and all of that completely not waterproof, transformed into a dongle, a plastic dongle, which has the antenna built in and everything that can be screwed in there for a waterproof connection. So your, your GPRS module still has a mini SIM card inside, which you actually put in, but it's, it's just not external. It's just connected there on the bottom. So now we go back to the GD100. We're gonna talk now about the GPRS module as a whole, right? So what you will find is um, it's a very simple module to connect, again. So it does connect to, to the inverter using um, essentially four wires, okay? So it's a 485, a common and some voltage, so you can power up the GPRS module. 
Um, we have them in stock uh, at the moment. We have MTN as a chosen network for okay. South Africa. Uh, we have Econet as the chosen network for Zimbabwe. Okay. Any other country, any other network can be done. Okay, so at this time it's just for a matter of, of consistency of some stock. So you will buy a prepaid card and you will actually keep the SIM card ID so you can remotely top it up. And, uh, and you just plug it into your GD100. So at the bottom, you can see on the left hand side there, it's got a little um, slot where you actually push a little button, it pops out, you put the SIM card and slot it in, and that's it. And that's it, correct. So it's super simple. Very simple again, guys, super simple to use. Four cables between the GD100 and the antenna. The common is a common. The 24 volts is marked on inverter. 485 is not used by anything else other than the GPRS module. Right. Okay. Um, now, for the for the for the very advanced people in the class or in the webinar, um, the GPRS module it's a, a 485 slave, if you will. So if you're using this um, 485 port already on the inverter because you're you have a, a control system from your computer, you just need to daisy chain them. So you just need to go from your computer to a GPS module and from the GPS module to the GD100. So via daisy chain, you're gonna be able to have access to all the slaves on the, on the chain, okay? So again, the GPS module is an RS-45 slave. So this is the same option, but now with the BPD. waterproof option on the BPD-100. So here there is no, either or so you have a communication uh, clock which is separated and dedicated right. which is added for rs485 and you have the dedicated gprs connection right so you essentially put your antenna okay. and if you need any other sort of control analog communication you see the communication protocol you use a common okay. communication port now where all this data actually ends well when you buy the equipment uh, we will create actually an account for you on the imbt cloud platform okay. So you get there the, the web address, iot.imbt.com, uh, uh, semicolon 12,000. And this is the access, this is what you get to see on the cloud platform. So you can see all the devices that are configured on the, your account. You can see all the faults, all the parameters, change parameters, uh, production of water, et cetera, et cetera. This cloud server is the one that actually serves the information to the apps. You can see there that there is actually a QR code to download the app from, from Android. If you, if you scroll down, you'll see that actually you can get the same for, for, for the iStore. So here we have a few print screens for the iStore version. Um, so it's pretty nice and modern. So functionalities, quite a few. So this is a print screen again from the same app. So you can start stop the, the pump. You, see, you can also pull a graph and actually see what your pump has produced over a period of time. What you've, you can see there, like your current flow, how much water you've gotten, when it started, when it stopped. You, you can also pull a graph over different seasons to see between summer and winter to see if you actually do need to over pedal or you can downscale on your system. Perfect. You, you can know what's happening. So, so in general, it's a quantum leap on operation of your, of your BSD. Okay, so you can select the input mode, cleaning times, uh, flow rate, uh, the height of the pump as well. Right. Of course, you have to feed a certain parameters of the pump itself. To the app, so they have to do all the calculation on, on the frequency. Okay, set minimum frequency, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here we have some more print screens from the app. So we have here five, six pumps which are being monitored with this specific account and this specific app. Mm -hmm. uh, we have historical faults. Most of the faults that you have there is just pretty much low voltage on the PV side, so which is a normal fault. <coughs> that's, that's what I would expect on, on the inverter, right? Okay. And then you have some other hard faults on the right there, so those orange, green, um, yeah. red, etc. Okay. Um, here you have the two QR codes for the apps. Um, the, app, the one on the app store downloads but was giving some trouble when communicating with the cloud. So IMBT was busy sorting that out. Uh, the one for Android is actually operational. Okay. It's working fine. As we mentioned, we got on the stock Zimbabwe and South Africa. Uh, Zambia, Malawi, Namibia, Mozambique, we can, we can do on demand. Yeah, correct. Okay, so electrical accessories. Again, this is just a guide. On what breaker you have to buy if you're going to buy all these things separately, right? So, all our recommendations for what you guys need to use. It's, it's correct. It's a recommendation for what we think you actually require depending on the, the model. Size, okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about. Um, that famous ripple that is produced on the output of the of the inverter. Mm -hmm. So you will see there um, on the top right that image looks like a trapezoid. 
Okay, so we have a, a black line and a red line, okay, um, being the, the, the red, the, the motor response, and, and being the black, the bus coming out of the drive. So these ripples coming out of the output on the inverter are really small, but as they go to the motor in a very long cable, they amplify, and when they come back, they can actually find some more ripples and keeps getting bigger and bigger. And bigger. Small, small, small. So in order to actually reduce the, the and it's unavoidable because the inverter uses uh, push width modulation. So there will be a minimal amount of ripple in it. Um, so for, for bigger cable lengths, so anything over 25 meters, mm -hmm. correct. So we need to put actually an, an, an inductance uh, reactor on the, on the line, on the cable going from the inverter into, into the pump. Yeah. So this will smooth in that, um, that ripple. So if that is not done, your motor will overheat and in time it will break. So that's been documented plenty. Sure. So this is, this is a certainty, okay? Um, which one and which size of reactor? So the reactor is essentially just, just coils which are connected in, in, um, in series to your, to be between your okay. converter and your, your motor. It really depends on the length of the cable, on the size of the motor, and in the size of the cable itself. So we'll be able to advise on a case-by-case -case scenario. We have a range of these reactors on stock. Yeah. Again, guys, you can see that it's very simple. You've got three inputs on top, three inputs at, or outputs at the bottom. You take your output of your VSD, connect it to the output at the bottom, you just go straight to your pump. Very simple to connect, nothing special, nothing needed. That's correct. It's in and out, so what you have in the picture, there is a three-phase one. Correct. So you're connecting non-neutral, only the, the current phases, so phase one, two, three, goes in, goes out, uh, the current is going through a coil. Okay, so that coil is just producing certain resistance to the current flow. That is more magnet electromagnetic resistance is what filters those okay. ripples. Okay. Uh, then on, on more severe cases of, of, of ripple, um, we have what is called a sangue filter, which is nothing else than the previous plus a bank of capacity. Uh, the capacitors are connected in parallel to the to the, the three, three, three lines going into the motor and still the, the, the reactor is connected in series. So you can see that UVW, each of them actually has a coil, right? So it's a it's an essentially an isolation transformer that you have there. Okay. So um, um, when this is required, okay, as we said, any inverter 4.4 kilowatts or bigger do come in a small capacitor bank. So that will be attempted first. Correct. Before having to buy additional capacitors, the capacitors is something you can buy on your own and install on your own. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can buy the choke. You, if that is not sufficient still to filter, you can st still add the capacitors. Okay. Typically, depending on the on the wiring of your pump, you might require this on bigger pumps. So you might require this on pumping setups of 50 kilowatts and, and bigger. Also, depth again will depend, guys. A lot of guys have got pumps that are usually between 30 and 60 meters. Shouldn't be a problem. But as soon as you start going to like 150, 170 meter deep holes, these sine will definitely be needed because of the distance of the cable running. That's correct. Okay, so I think that we're towards the end, the tail end of the presentation. So we've got a few examples here. And this is an example that actually is using four pumps. Um, the, the, it is possible by using special software to have four inverters to communicate via the RS485 port and work in a master slave configuration. So each essentially each motor has its own inverter which is connected to its own um, solar array but because the four pumps are connected on the output hydraulic hydraulically we can actually have a pressure sensor on the output of each of them and a pressure sensor on the manifold so we can make sure that we have a constant pressure output so we can actually slightly adjust the the, the pump one to pump three or pump four to pump two to make sure that at all times we keep a uh, uh, constant uh, uh, as long as there is enough power to do so. Okay. So this presumes that the four solar arrays are positioned facing the same direction, they have no shading, they are going up and down during the day exactly in the same way. So then, then you can do this fine tuning. Okay. okay, so I should be careful to say that you will not be keeping constant pressure, you keep constant speed. So we're just making sure that four pumps work at unison. So they will start producing mm -hmm. liter in the beginning and then they will go to maximum pressure, maximum uh, flow in the middle of the day and then will start decaying in the afternoon. So, but you will not have one problem more than the other. Okay. 
So the frequency across the board will be the same. So they, they will work the same speeds essentially, so they can keep that manifold working essentially with the same, same clock. So as I said, the inverters do not have to be put on inclusion necessarily. So this is an example of a three-phase inverter installed in a, in a wall. So to the bottom right, you can see how that reactor actually looks in real life. So it's not a huge, small, massive thing. The, the picture makes it look a bit bigger than what it is. And then to the left, you have your GPRS communication module. Uh, I know this is a 4.4 kilowatts or bigger because it doesn't have a PU sensor. Okay, so it's a, it's a bit, it's, and, you've got the, and you've got the keypad correct connected to it. Same example, much nicer uh, setup. setup in a box. Uh, you can see to the left the switching board. So that's the switching board on the left. You can see the inverter, you can see the relay and the contactor right there on the, the bottom of the image. You can even see a timer, right? So this customer has put a timer to make sure that regardless of the sun condition, this only goes certain times. Because it has AC input, right? So maybe this customer do not want this to go at night, for example. So they're controlling that via an external timer. Mm -hmm. So an external timer is controlling the power going into a relay. Therefore, okay. the contactor do not see any power, but only at the times that that, that, that timer actually loads. So good example. And, uh, and I think this is what we have for today, please. Yes, guys. Um, so we are here. If you guys need anything, if you need any further information, you guys don't understand something, we will send you all the documentation. There is a link to a YouTube video regarding this. But we are here, guys. We are more than welcome to help you guys anytime you need. All the information, the presentation, technical documentation will be sent a little bit later today. Uh, we'll be hanging this video on our YouTube page. Uh, please, please, please like, share, and subscribe. <laughs> that help us actually to reach more people and more to, and again, to yeah. make this knowledge more available to everyone. Okay? Sure. So thank you very much for your attendance today. And we're looking forward to talk to you in the near future. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a good day.